Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Cody Candy of Bounce coming to us from San Francisco. How's your day going, Cody? It's going well. Thanks so much for having me, Nathan. Yeah, glad to have you on the show. I'm excited to get into it. Well, um, what is Bounce? What do you guys do? Yeah, Bounce is an app and, mobile and web platform for short-term storage all over the city, hosted by local businesses, such as hotels or dry cleaners, everything in between that have extra space. So you open our app and you can find a place virtually anywhere to leave your things. Um, $6 per day. Um, and then we're also building uh, delivery on top of that. Delivery of, uh, oh, you mean to get delivery packages from Amazon or something? Or? Uh, no. So basically you open the bounce app and you can leave your things, your backpack, your luggage, your gym bag, whatever it is. Uh, and then from there, you can either go back to that spot and pick it up or have it delivered to where you'll be later or to another bounce location. And so is the main use case just travelers who are in a city for a day and they want to go sightseeing without carrying their suitcase around or are there other use cases? Yeah. Yeah. So travel is the biggest use case. Uh, basically, yeah, before a trip or after a trip, uh, folks, the, the, basically the whole premise of Bounce is that people spend so much time planning their days around the things that they own, planning their lives around the things that they own. And so one, one particular use case is you arrive to a city uh, the status quo is you go straight to a hotel just to drop your stuff off, even if that's out of the way of where you're going. People waste so much time commuting out of the way for their things. So with Bounce, it's this idea that you have a place virtually anywhere in the city to leave your things um, and, and you get all that time back. You're, you're much more flexible. You can run around. And um, uh, yeah, basically that's one use case. Uh, but we also have locals that use us. Um, they'll be say active urban professionals. Maybe they have meetings throughout town and they don't want to carry their things everywhere. Um, this could be a gym bag, this could be a sales kit, uh, whatever it may be. We, we have all kinds of fun use cases. We have a, a magician that uses us regularly, um, who is storing his magic kit. Uh, yeah, it's, it's basically this whole premise that people shouldn't spend so much time lugging their things around with them. So to go into a city, do you have to go and recruit all these dry cleaners and, hotels so you have kind of a market of available space first and then what do you do next do you put in like lockers or is it more like my bag is stuffed under the desk or something or how's that work yeah so the value propositions for the stores are are uh, really strong so the first one is you get a cut of the revenue um, and then the second one is we drive extra traffic to your store and that one's actually more powerful um, brick and mortar sque being squeezed and so the ability to drive traffic into your door for free um, and potentially once themselves is, is very big um, so selling those two value props makes it a ton of new locations on board uh, we can launch a city in under a week um, we put 15 locations in San Francisco in one week when we launched that as our second market New York City was our first market um, and so the supply side, we can, we can brute force our way through. Um, and then we're also scaling that up so we can, um, we can do it with less and less human involvement, if you will. Um, the other question you asked me was uh, what do we form factor? Is it like lockers or, or just yeah. any closet or what? Yeah. It's extremely scalable. We don't use any hardware, any lockers, anything like that. Uh, we have tags, uh, these plastic security seals that will go around uh, bags that all the stores have. Um, those cost us six to 10 cents um, from China. Um, and uh, that basically secures the, the items. But um, more importantly, all the stores are required to have secure storage space out of the reach of customers. So basically, you, you, book, uh, you book storage on bounce. Uh, you come and drop it off. And then it's uh, secured, put away. And then when you come back, you show the matching number and then you get your bag back. What's the hardest part about this? It, I was going to say, is it recruiting storage units? It sounds like that's probably not so hard. Is it overcoming like trust of users to store my bag at a random dry cleaner? <laughs> or yeah, what? I think trust is a big one. Um, it's the number one question we get. We, it is safe. We've never had anything negative happen. Um, uh, no one's stuff has ever been lost. Uh, the worst that's happened is, is folks show up and, and the store opens a little bit late. That's happened a, a couple of times. Uh, and, and that's really bad. And, and we, we, we've done a lot to prevent that since then. But uh, generally speaking, your stuff is extremely safe with bounce. Um, these stores, they all sign contracts with us. 
um, they all feel a sense of responsibility for storing the items as well. Um, and so um, from, from the sort of literal standpoint of is this safe, the answer is yes, but there's certainly more we can do from a feeling, the, the emotional standpoint. Uh, if you leave your, your bag with your laptop in it, do you feel safe leaving it at this dry cleaner? So um, that's, a, that's a big part of, of our job. The, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And do, I guess the foot traffic makes a lot of sense too from a, a store's perspective. They, could they really make much money? I don't know what your rev share is, but you know, certainly you're not storing more than 10 bags a day or something at a couple bucks a bag. Is it sort of more just the traffic is the real motivator there? Uh, you know, it actually varies from business to business. For hotels, they might store far more than 10 bags a day, but the revenue might be, uh, if, if they make an extra $1,000 a month, that might actually be insignificant for them when they're selling rooms for 250 a night. Um, so for them, it's more about bringing people into their premises and exposing uh, high quality leads, if you will, into their brand and maybe they're spending money at their restaurant or their bar. Um, but for someone like a dry cleaner, making a few hundred dollars extra every month can can be really, uh, can be a big deal for them. So um, it's, it's a bit of both actually. Yeah. Very cool. And where did you come up with this idea? What were, what's the backstory? Yeah. So I came up with the idea several years before starting it. Um, I had spent a lot of time traveling and living abroad. Um, some of that thanks to work um, and some of that thanks to uh, personal travel. And as a result of moving around a lot, I've lived in 12 cities now. Um, I um, downsized to uh, basically two suitcases and a backpack worth of possessions. Mm -hmm. And I was returning from a, a six month work trip in, in India and I realized that the things that I had packed two and a half suitcases was really all I needed to, to live. I didn't really need anything further than that. And so I got rid of everything else I owned and I, I just, uh, the freedom that that gave me was, was really powerful. And I started seeing this problem over and over again of people planning their days and planning their lives around the things that they own. And I thought that was, that was ridiculous. Uh, but also it's, it's, it's unknown. It's like people are so used to it that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not always in your face. And so it, what, what, what really hit me when I was, um, the magic moment for thinking of balance was when I was with some friends after work, some colleagues after work one night and someone said, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to come join you guys uh, half hour later. Oh, actually I need to go home just to drop my stuff off, but then I'm coming back to this area. And I was just thinking, wow, you're going to spend 20 minutes to go drop something off and then 20 minutes back, you know, that might even be you know, racking up Uber or taxi fares. And then, um, of course your time. And I'm like, that's crazy. You should be able to just, you should plan your day around your things. Yeah. And so the original idea for bounce was actually that someone will come and pick up your stuff directly. Um, and then whenever you want it back, they'll bring it back to you. Um, and then I can tell you the story about how we, uh, how we got started. So the reason I didn't start that business right away was because um, it was it was really logistically complex. Um, the whole logistics network, yeah, so many logistics companies have uh, have failed unfortunately. And um, so I was, uh, it was it was my buddy um, my buddy Nathan King, who was a former colleague at Intuit. He, we were talking about businesses to start, and he was like, "Hey, Cody, why don't you start Bounce? You were so passionate about it a couple of years ago." And I thought, you know, what have we got to lose? Like, let's, let's do some lean testing. Let's try this out. So basically my co-founder and I, we put a landing page up and we got city bike memberships and basically built a super MVP prototype of bounce in uh, like four hours and started riding city bikes around uh, fulfilling orders. And sure enough, we learned that the logistics piece is, is really hard in the beginning. We were um, so exhausted uh, riding around. And I was like, fit though, right? Probably your fittest <laughs> you've ever been in your life. I would yeah. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and so we thought, how can we simplify this further? And so that's when we had the idea to, you know, what if we didn't have to meet the customer directly? What if they can meet it at certain bounce locations? And then how could, how could we do this without having uh, to pay rent, right? We were, we were bootstrapping this in the beginning, so we didn't have money for storage units. So then we talked to small business owners and they said, oh yeah, like, we'd be happy to do this. Um, so we simplified the model to pick up and drop off points for businesses. And then from there, we found there were enough people willing to drop off and pick up from the same place that we could start even more simply than that. Yeah. Sim 
you literally just drop off and pick up at a business and, and that's it. So that's what the products, that's what the MVP, the, the product of the last year has looked like. And now we're adding in the logistics pieces where you can actually drop off at a business, pick up at another business right now. So it's been a, a fun journey. And now we, we finally have uh, funding to um, make some of these, these bolder uh, uh, decisions. Cool. What's it? So it's six bucks to store. And then how much is a delivery if I want it? Yeah. So we're playing around with a price point for that right now. Um, something like $18 is, is sort of what we're hovering around. Um, uh, but still sort of, you know, there'll be some, some variance to that. For example, if someone wants an airport trip, it'll probably, it will certainly cost more. And you're in New York and San Francisco. Is that right? New York and San Francisco are our primary markets. We also have presence in DC, LA, Chicago, and Boston. And can you share any uh, metrics, number of bags stored or some other vanity metric or, or other KPI? What, how yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've stored uh, tens of thousands of bags to date. Um, when we raised our round, we had hit 100K of annualized revenue and that was within, um, within I think a little bit over six months of, uh, of starting. Mm -hmm. um, cool, congrats. Okay, good. Interesting concept. I love this sort of, um, what do they call it? The I guess the sharing economy, right? I mean, you fit in the sharing economy where you're sort of utilizing all these underutilized assets, which the space under your, or, you know, the closet at your dry cleaner is an underutilized asset that you wouldn't think of. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Let's talk about fundraising. Um, how much you guys raised and how many rounds? Just one round, right? Yeah, so we raised a little over a million. Um, we just announced that a couple of weeks ago. We finished that round um, at the end of last summer. And was that a VC or angels or? Uh, it was both. A little bit heavier on the angels, but we also had a couple of VCs in there. Who, who led it? What was the? Uh, the so the, the, uh, our biggest investor is Seabed VC. Um, the, uh, the founder of that firm is Vijay Ulal, who is um, an absolutely amazing investor and a longtime technology executive. He worked for Intel in the 1980s and um, Fairchild Semiconductor as, uh, as president. Uh, wow. after that. Yeah, That's really going, going back to the, the founding of Silicon Valley. Yeah. yeah. Talking yeah. Fairchild Semiconductor. <laughs> yeah. Like the bed of a sea ocean? Yeah, that's right. Got it. And, and who, any other names you want to mention? Uh, yeah, so... We have uh, Jillian Manis was uh, was very very instrumental in, in helping close a lot of investors with us as well. Um, she put in um, personal money and brought in a few others. Um, she is the managing direct managing partner of Structure Capital. Okay. Uh, they invested in um, Uber among uh, other uh, great companies, and then um, she brought in a guy by the name of Rob Chestnut, who's the general counsel of Airbnb. He has some incredible experience and expertise um, for us, especially with trust and safety being such a key part of, of building bounce. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have, we have, we have a, a long list. We have more than a dozen investors in our round and okay. they're all absolutely phenomenal and uh, could probably, could probably talk about all of them for, for another 20 minutes. Let's talk about the process of raising it. So you, you raised it last summer. When did you start it? And you know, how did you kind of identify folks like Rob Chestnut sounds like a perfect fit or how'd you kind of put it all together? Yeah. So we started fundraising in May and I spent some time before that really uh, preparing for that. So talking to uh, founders, uh, founder friends who have raised money or um, friends in the, in the VC industry. Um, they gave me a ton of tips and a ton of intros. Um, so really, really made my, my list of, of folks I wanted to speak to leading up to May. Um, so that way, once, once May came around and we officially started fundraising, we could just, um, you know, talk to as many people as quickly as possible. And that was really helpful. I highly recommend that process. Um, and then from there, we had a couple of, um, the, the round almost was, was started and finished in May. Um, there was at least one firm that was going to, um, take most of our round and, 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 and get it done. But, um, uh, yeah, there are just some weird dynamics there where, um, you know, commitments are always commitments, uh, or, you know, things come in. And so, um, yeah, that actually set us back in a couple of ways where, you know, we told other investors, Hey, actually this round is moving really fast. So we need to know if you're in or not right now. Um, but, um, luckily we had a really good growth. Um, at that time we were growing about 50% month over month. And, um, 
a lot of fundraising, which was, which was really tough. Um, lots and lots of work, lots of sleepless nights. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, yeah, just kept going through, going through meeting more people. A lot of intros turned into further intros. And, um, I would say in June, we had a lot of soft commitments and some initial checks in. And then it was July when everything, when the dominoes tipped and everything seemed to come together pretty quickly. I want to talk about that, but first I want to go back, you know, so you had, you, you thought you had all this momentum and I think this is an interesting dynamic, right? Cause sometimes when you get someone to commit, then you can use that as a catalyst to get everyone else really fired up and rallied around. But then it sounds like those guys either pulled back or kind of ghosted you. I think you mentioned um, before the call, like, and then how do you go message that? So, I mean, do you have any sense of what happened, why they got cold feet? And also, if you already mentioned that to other investors and then these guys are gone and sort of disappear, how do you communicate that in a, in a <laughs> positive spin? Yeah. yeah, it was all kind of confusing. And, you know, I think a lot of investors get uh, negative uh, reactions for, for ghosting or not committing or never saying no. And <clears throat> it is frustrating and annoying for the entrepreneur, but I think it's, it's somewhat reasonable because writing a big check, whether it's your own money or someone else's money is a, a really big deal, right? Especially if you're unsure about it and startups are there's very little certainty with startups. And so, um, yeah, I definitely give the benefit of the doubt to, um, to investors, but I will say a lot of the, the best investors, um, and the ones with the biggest brand names, they, they really do, um, come through and you really see that. Um, but yeah, in this case, we, um, yeah, we, we thought that it was moving really fast and there was, I was reading the Paul Graham fundraising essay and it says, don't count, don't count money unless it's, it's in. And I think that's such good advice because, um, yeah, I think, I think trying to, trying to get behind the scenes, understand, you know, how some of these deals happen, uh, especially with the bigger venture firms, um, the way they do deals might be different from one firm to the next, right? One might be if one partner says, let's do it, let's do it. If another firm has a deal where it's, it has to be unanimous um, consent, then, um, then that's what makes it happen. And so I really don't know what happened behind the scenes with, 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 uh, you know, with some scenarios that we've had, but um, uh, yeah, it could be, it could be as simple as, you know, one partner poo pooing the deal or, you know, another partner or another investor saying, you know, oh, is this competitive with a portfolio company? And then, you know, they might not know the answer fully themselves. And so they might just sit on it and then um, you're just sort of stuck there waiting. And I, I think the best thing for a founder to do is, is to, uh, to, to, to not count uh, a maybe as a yes and just to basically count everything as a no until, until the paperwork is signed. Yeah, for sure. Did you get as far as, you know, term sheet negotiations with those guys or were you locked up kind of exclusive and you weren't, you stopped talking to other firms? Did you get that far or is it? Uh, they said, they said, come in, let's, let's chat about term sheets. Uh, let's talk about terms. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's, and, and I keep harping this cause I think it is something that's really good to drill into founders brains that, you know, until you really have the check, you have to be still hustling all angles. I've seen that happen where startups, they hate, everyone hates fundraising, right? It's no fun. It's a pain. It's distracting. And you get someone that seems like they're committing or, or going to be committing. They're, they're good to go. And then, you know, that drags out or they kind of say no and it disrupts the whole process. So it's like, it's, it's a hard thing to understand, right? But you got to, put that in people's heads that you have to keep hustling just as hard, even if this one seems like a yes until that money, really only the money, when the money crosses the, the bank account, is it a true yes, right? Yeah, that's right. So, that's right. Yeah. Interesting. And then, so in, in July, the dominoes tipped, as you mentioned, what do you think was the catalyst, you know, cause that's the other part that people struggle with a lot. It's like, I'm talking to all these people, got some interest, some soft commitments, getting it to tip. Did you do anything? Did it just organically happen? What tipped it? Yeah, so it was, um, it was two things that happened um, around the same time that, that was really helpful. Um, the first was we went on the, the pitch podcast 
and a pitch bounce that was an amazing opportunity. Um, got a couple of investors who came through off of that. Um, and then while that was coming together, um, Vijay from Seabed, he had, we previously met him and he said that, um, uh, one of the, one of the sort of contingencies that he had for investing was, um, my, my co-founder had a, a pending visa application and he said, you know, that is risky. So can I write the check once the, uh, once the visa's in, mm. and, um, you know, it's, it's funny, you hear a lot of uh, stories where an investor says, you know, hey, once you bring me this, I'll come in. In this case, when the visa came in, um, Vijay actually wrote a check pretty much like within, within days he was ready to write that check. And um, so I have immense respect for, for him or, or anyone who says, you know, hey, uh, once you have this, then, you know, then they follow through. So that came through at the same time that the pitch happened. And I think that, um, yeah, from an investor perspective, it does make things easier. It does feel really good if you have other investors, um, investing, um, you know, if you're, if you're writing a, a check, you don't want to feel like you're the only one writing a check because there are some risks with that. Like, um, you might need a certain amount of money to get to the next level. And if you can only raise a portion of that and you might not make it all the way and then their, their money does, you know, doesn't last as long. So I, I think there are a lot of reasonable things there that happen. So for us, when Vijay was in and then when the pitch podcast uh, investors came in, Jillian, Jillian Mattis and, and Michael Hyatt, when they came in, um, it was a, a really nice feeling of like, wow, this is happening. Um, there are other people doing this. And then there were, there were other investors where we said uh, they had given us soft commitments. And, um, and then we said, actually, Jillian gave me a lot of great advice. She was like, here's what you do. You pick a closing date and then you say, all right, we got to get all the paperwork in. And it was really driving that process home. That was, was really important. I think that because the fundraising process can often be long and drawn out, um, you don't realize that there's a point where you need to say, all right, this is the closing date or sign the paperwork by this date and wire the money by this date. So once I did that and, um, you know, uh, maybe everyone came through who had committed, um, uh, and then from there, there were more people who said, oh, actually, I have a friend who would, who would really be interested in this deal. Can I bring them in? And then those were the, the further dominoes of, of the round um, increasing from there. Yeah, cool. So VJ was, once VJ kind of says, I'm in, how long, how long out did you pick a closing date? Just first, do you remember? Was it a month or was it two weeks or what? Um, yeah, it was, it was probably about two weeks. And, and the day when, when VJ said I'm in, it was right around the same time, maybe the same day or same week that um, Jillian and Michael said, let's do this. And so, um, and then we already had a lot of soft commitments stacked up. So then it was a conversation of like, all right, how do we, how do we do this? Let's confirm the terms. And um, Jillian said, like, yeah, pick a day, like two weeks from now works. And then, um, and we did that. So let's talk about the mechanics of that. Cause I haven't really covered that on this the show that much, you know, you pick the closing, closing date, you message everyone that VJ is leading this, here are the terms. Um, and then what you just say, I need your signed, you know, signed term sheet in by, by this date. And then the wire by what, or, you know, what was the sort of like mechanics of it? Yeah. So it was a little, it was a little more complicated than that actually, because we originally set out to raise on a safe and, Everyone was on board for that, but Vijay was a little uncomfortable with that. Um, the risk with safes is that um, uh, if you don't raise money again, it might not turn into equity or, or and it's not debt. So um, a convertible note is better for investors. So Vijay asked if we could do a convertible note. Um, so there's actually, through this process, we were changing the terms, which was really stressful. Um, but uh, luckily it all came through. And so basically sent the terms to everyone all the investors and said, this is what, you know, we're, we're likely going to do. Please, uh, please provide your, your feedback and, and, and edits. Um, we try to make this as investor friendly and as standard as possible. Um, because quite frankly, we could rack up, you know, a hundred K in legal fees yeah. if we return and that would be, you know, a huge percentage of the round. Yeah. And, um, so a lot of what I had to do actually was, um, uh, there were, there were maybe a couple of investors who were asking questions of, can we do this turn? Can we do this turn? And, um, I would, I would have to, you know, in, in, in some cases we could add some extra terms and, and make it work, but it was unanimous for everyone. Um, in other cases, I just had to say, you know, no, we can't do that. 
um, uh, or spend more time building trust if it was an investor I hadn't spent that much time yet with yet. Um, and then basically had the standardized set of terms, uh, basically said, you know, can you sign up by this date and then can you wire by this date? And then it happened. You remember any term that you pushed back on? Um, yeah. So I think that if it, the farther away investors are from Silicon Valley, the more, um, foreign, a safe or convertible note will look. So there was, um, there was someone was asking about uh, most favored nation on top of the convertible note, and that's um, not super standard, um, and it's it's uh, it's a little harder for the the the, the founder to, to think about things in the future, especially if they need to raise a bridge round or something like that. And so that was one of the terms I remember. But um, yeah, I, I think there were some some other ones that were less significant. Interesting. Yeah, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Um, yeah, it basically means most third nation means that uh, if you let an investor in in the future with any other terms that you, uh, they can get those same terms. Gotcha. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so if you were to um, be in the unfortunate position where you have to raise a down round, um, then the whole sort of valuation equation that you had for raising this round, which might've made sense for the business at that time, all those investors would then, you know, knock down to that lower valuation. And then you might, you might end up, you know, if you were going to give away, say, 10% of your company in a, in a down round, you might end, that might turn into like 30%. So yeah. it can be really risky and really scary. Totally. I can see that. Definitely. Very interesting. Um, cool. So I think we've covered a lot of stuff. Um, with structure, I know structure, did structure actually come in or was it Jenny of structure? Um, Jillian invested personally. I'm sorry, Jillian or Jenny? Jillian. Jillian, sorry. Gotcha. Yeah, because structure, isn't their focus like this sort of sharing economy or are they still doing that? I remember it was for a while. Yeah, I think their thesis is um, investing in companies that take advantage of underutilized assets. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, any other uh, lessons learned? Oh, you you mentioned uh, before the call, we chatted briefly, you mentioned there was a, a potential competitive investment that was sort of interested in acquiring you guys. You want to tell that story real quick? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So in the middle of the whole process, there was a much bigger company um, that was interested in acquiring Bounce. Um, They originally came and said, hey, maybe we want to invest in the round. And then they invited us into their office and we came in and long story short, it turned into actually, we don't want to invest. We don't want to partner. We just want to acquire you. And, um, we said like, great, let's think about it. And, um, when we came back and told them, no, they said, Hey, you know, can we, can we go for dinner? Can we chat? And they said, um, they were basically, you know, doing a hard sell to try to convince us to sell to them. Um, and they said, you know, hey, we talked to some investors that you were talking to. And um, uh, yeah, I, th- I think they were trying to spook us a little bit and it, it certainly worked. Um, and uh, yeah, there were a couple investors who weren't before all this or, or maybe maybe after this, but without knowing, um, they said they couldn't invest in Bounce because of a, a competitor investment, which was this company. And so it was just a, a crazy thing. It was, it, it was, it felt like a scene from a Hollywood movie where my co-founder, my co-founder Alex and I are sitting at this table and here are these, these, these two other folks and they're, you know, um, they're, they're playing their cards of being the, the bigger, you know, very well funded company and, uh, you know, certainly using some intimidation tactics and, uh, afterwards my co-founder and I were just like, wow, like what is happening? Um, and so that was, uh, an extra dynamic thrown into the mix. That is interesting though. Yeah. And, it, uh, was it a, I don't know if you ever got to the offer stage, but was it enough where you had to consider, Hey, maybe we'll just take this quick exit and, you know, go buy a, a ski lodge at Tahoe and ski <laughs> for a year or, or no. <laughs> um, so I would say, it wasn't anything that would be, if it were to be life-changing, it would depend on the success of this company. A lot of it was, uh, it, it was mostly stock. Gotcha. stock company. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was pretty much, Hey, do we believe in, in this company more? Or do we believe in, in bounce more? And, uh, my co-founder and I, um, 
we really feel like we're, we're building our life's work. We, we want to work the rest of our lives on bounce. Um, we have a massive, massive vision. Um, we want bounce to be uh, basically a remote control for your things um, where, you know, you take your phone and you can summon your things to you or away from you, basically build this really powerful logistics mm -hmm. network. And um, yeah, we, you know, it's a, a long journey to get to a vision like that. And um, yeah, so it's really, do we want to bet on ourselves or do we want to bet on other people? And um, we're just far too excited about what we're doing and also the, the momentum and, and, and traction that we've had, uh, although we're still really early, that um, we wanted to, uh, to, to, to keep pushing through and, and, and hope, to, hope to be doing this for a very, very, very long time. Did that company go out and raise more money after not buying you or is it sort of becoming a competition? I mean, I, you always, when you talk about story like that, you hear, you think of Uber and Airbnb and I think Uber was telling investors, you know, if you invest in them, we'll never, I mean, there was kind of that trying to poison the well, so to speak a little bit. I think. Yeah. 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 So I actually don't view this company as a competitor. Um, I think from a vision standpoint, we um, like down the road, it's possible. But I think that if they're really successful at what they do for the next five years and we're really successful at what we do for the next five years, it won't, it won't um, interfere. If they go on to be a, you know, a multi-billion dollar company and, and we do the same, then that's when it would probably be competitive. But, you know, the chance you, you can't really solve, you can't really plan for the long term when the chances of, of, of that happening is, is, is low. Cool. Good. It's All right. I think we're almost done. Any, um, are you, are you starting to think about another round yet? Are you, uh, are you of the mindset that you're, and this is something I picked up a pattern, you know, talking to folks, either you're always raising or other people have the mindset that you raise for three months and then you're totally focused on the business, then come back and raise for two or three months. What, what's your opinion? Yeah. So my opinion, my opinion is a little bit of both. It is that, uh, when you really go all out for a fundraise, you should really go all out. That should be your full-time job for one of the founders. And, uh, you want to line up as many meetings in a shorter time as possible. Um, so I spend, uh, almost none of my time per week now on fundraising, but if someone intros me to someone who would be an awesome future investor, then I'll, I'll always chat with them. Um, I shouldn't say always 0%, 0 uh, I actually met with uh, uh, an investor this week just to, just to get to know them. And, um, but yeah, if someone introduces me to someone who, who is, you know, where we'll learn from each other or where they could be a, a future partner with us, um, then I'll, I'll absolutely take that meeting. Um, but generally speaking, I, I, I think that fundraising is, is done very effectively when, um, when you have many, many meetings at once. Is there anything you'll do differently for the next round, which I, would assume would be a series A or maybe a, a seed two. Anything you'll do kind of differently that time next time? Uh, yeah, actually I learned so much through this fundraising process that if I could do it all over again differently, I would. Um, the number one thing I learned is that um, probably 80% of investors, this is true for 80% of investors. The biggest reason, the biggest factor to invest in a company is um, the, uh, how do I say this? Um, the biggest reason other investors invest is the, the desire from other investors. Mm -hmm. right? um, if other investors are interested, that's sort of the thing that sparks, uh, sparks them the most. Um, that's not true for all investors, but it's true enough for, for many that if I could go back and do it all over again, I would not take any meetings with investors who aren't willing to write a check until X happens before X happens. So if someone says, Hey, I can't invest until I need a lead investor. Um, then it's pretty much pointless. I shouldn't say completely pointless, but it can be a lot. Of, it could be a waste of time, um, to take those meetings until you have a lead, um, because they could go on forever. And, um, yeah, there are a lot of investors out there and if they're not, if they're not in a position to write a check, then you can spend a lot of time just having conversations with, with non, with, with no one that's going to tip the dominoes. But how do you know that before pitching them and taking the meeting, whether they're that type of investor that need a lead, right? I mean, isn't that usually come out in the meeting or are you able to somehow identify that beforehand? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would say it's a bit of both. So, um, uh, I would say, 
when being introduced to an investor, you know, let's say a friend uh, or another investor is investing and, you know, they'll, not, they'll, they'll often say like, oh, this person would need a, need to have a lead first or this person wouldn't, then, um, you know, then you know that from there. And then right. sometimes I'll have like an initial phone meeting. And, and if you're traveling even like a half hour to go meet someone from, say from the Mission District to Jackson Square, that's like a half hour trip. Yeah. So if you're meeting for an hour and then, you know, half hour each way of transportation time, that's two hours. And, um, uh, so, you know, if, if you talk to someone on the phone, you can say, Hey, is this, is this something where we should chat now? Or should I save, should I, should we save this meeting until once I have a lead? Cause I think a lot of folks who, who won't invest till they have a lead, like not all of them want to meet right away either. Um, yeah. but no one wants to miss out. So people are more willing to take meetings than they should. But, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of optimization and, and time saved that can be done there. I, I like that actually. Yeah. I think that's, that's a good you know, even a quick phone screen asking just like what you said, should we check now or should I come back whenever lead kind of yeah. identifies whether they're a leader or a follower and you yeah. can kind of optimize, like you're saying for, for the rest of the, for your time yeah. on the round. Yeah. Even uh, the email you can ask, you know, we, we uh, when we kicked off the fundraising presses, we started getting some cold outreach from investors mm-hmm. and um, yeah, if they didn't tell me who introduced them or how they heard about us, I would ask them, you know, some of these preliminary questions. And uh, I, I turned down some meetings or said, Hey, let's wait until, you know, let's wait until, um, you know, it's, it's a more appropriate time for us to chat. What was jumping around a little bit, but what was this pitch podcast you mentioned? What is that? Is that yeah. That? So the pitch podcast by Gimlet media, um, it is right. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, they do every, every Wednesday, when they're in season, they have an episode with a founder that pitches to a panel of um, usually four or five investors. And um, yeah, you're right there on the spot. Everyone's grilling you all at the same time. And uh, they'll often commit or, or reject you right on the show. And is this done in a physical location or on the phone or on physical a web? Location. Physical location. Yeah. And how did you get on that show? And who are your judges? You yes. Yeah. So we were a part of WeWork Labs. And we, we still are actually. Um, and um, Jake Sukoff, uh, we were Glass manager in New York. He, uh, who's, who's uh, really helpful. He's, he's been an awesome, awesome support for Bounce. He, uh, uh, the Pitch Podcast reached out to him and said, hey, do you have any startups that you think would be good for this um, based on timing and when they're raising their round and traction and all that. And so he referred us. We had an initial phone screen with Josh Muccio, the, uh, the producer. And then... Um, Josh and I hit it off and he said, yeah, I'd love to have you come in New York city, uh, you know, June something, uh, that's the recording day. And then, uh, the five investors on the panel were Jillian Manis, Michael Hyatt, um, uh, Charles Hudson from precursor ventures, mm-hmm. uh, Nicole Verkint and, um, Phil Nadell. And, uh, one of those investors bowed out because they had a competitive investment. Um, and then, um, Phil Nadell uh, is uh, he about actually all, all five investors said no at one point on the show. And then, uh, and then it, it turned around after that. All five of them? You turned all, all five of them initially said uh, no or bowed out. And then they turned around. And ended up writing a check? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, that's killer. That's great. Let's talk about that just for a minute. And not to make this longer than it needs to be, but how'd you turn them around? Or was it just once you got seabed they they were interested again oh, no, no, no. We, we turned uh we turned jillian around right there on the show um so yeah basically first of all the dynamic in the room is is really strange because you're pitching five investors at once and not all investors invest with the same mindset or the same criteria and so when one investor wants to go deeper on a topic but another doesn't need to go deeper then it's, it's the sort of thing how do you manage you're literally having five conversations at once not necessarily mm-hmm. one conversation and um yeah so basically um we were going through and then there was a point where folks were saying you know where they stand on the investment and then um i feel like i didn't address i I didn't get everything i wanted to say across so when they said no i uh, kept pitching in a way and then um (laughs) feeling was like actually I, i i gotta go in on this um so she was in and then um, Michael Hyatt was kind of a maybe. Nicole was kind of a maybe. Um, Phil Nadell is really a, a numbers guy. I think um, I think he invests with Series A criteria, not necessarily 
criteria. Um, so he wasn't a fit. He said no. And then um, Charles um, uh, bowed out of the process. Um, and um, uh, yeah, then after Jillian came in, she, uh, she said she was chatting with Michael and, and Michael decided to come in as well. <laughs> How funny. Usually if you just keep pitching when someone says no, it doesn't really work. <laughs> so that's good for you for, you must have a sales DNA in your, in your blood or something. Um, <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, this is good. Um, if people want to learn more, is it just bounce.com or, or is there a, a new you know, I, I wish we owned the, the domain bounce.com. Uh, our domain is use bounce.com. U S B B O U N C E.com. And, uh, our app is about to be in the app store. So by the time folks are listening to this, you can search bounce, uh, bag storage in the app store and you'll be able to find it. Um, and, uh, yeah, we could give a, a discount to, to folks on the show. Um, sure, do you have a code uh, or something? Yeah, I can make I can make it right after this. So let's do. Uh, the, I think we just can say the code is how I raised it. So put that in, and that'll be say thirty uh, percent uh, off. Um, and maybe we'll have to cap that at like the first hundred people that use it. Um, but yeah, I would always love other founders, other entrepreneurs, other folks in the industry trying us out, giving us feedback. So folks try it and want to give us feedback. That's great. Uh, that'd be, that'd be phenomenal. And, um, yeah, we're going to be pushing, pushing, uh, some marketing, getting our name out there soon. So, uh, hope to have it in the hands of, of many very, very soon. Very cool. All right. Well, thanks for the discount code and, uh, it sounds fun. And next time I'm on a trip to New York or something, this sounds just perfect. So, or here in SF, I guess, if I'm out and about, um, all right, Cody, thanks so much. Have a good weekend, and we'll catch you after your next round. Thank you so much.